I don't get to come down to Florida very often because my work, working for the General Conference, takes me all over the world. Uh, so as soon as we finish here, we return back home, and then the 12th, which is next weekend, we fly to Guam, and then after Guam, we fly to Australia, and we'll be in Australia for five months. So we will not be back uh, stateside until June. So that's the way our uh, time goes. But let's pray together as we consider God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this church and the freedom that we experience here. That we do not have to be worrying about the police coming in and finding out if we're worshiping or not. But we know the day will come soon. So we pray that you'll help us each to be grounded in Jesus. Bless the message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, when you talk to Buddhists, and by the way, we're uh, in training the Chinese, we were able to get into the village, the Chinese village, and uh, they had 36 Bible studies for 36 Buddhist families. I didn't hear one amen. What happened? Amen. So, and we were able to baptize three Buddhists, and uh, the work is, is going to continue there. Uh, the General Conference uh, was surprised because uh, they put in a missionary in Thailand for 13 years and there was only one baptism in 13 years. So when they discovered that we had baptized three uh, Buddhists in 30 days that we were training, uh, they were surprised and excited. So naturally they want to see that thing continue and uh, we want to make sure it does continue. But of course, uh, we have to work carefully around that area. Now, there are many strangers to divine influences. That means that there are people who are not aware that there is something divine or something supernatural. In fact, sad to say that most people know more about the devil than they know about God. Most people are more afraid of the devil than they are of God. Uh, in, in many countries, people practice spiritualism in different forms, uh, evil. And yet, uh, while they worship all these things, they're not cognizant, not aware that there is such a thing as God. So the scripture then uh, brings us to, a, to an understanding that there are many times that God is not known because he cannot be seen. And people base their... A rejection of God because they have not seen him however there are many things around us that we do not see but that are affecting our lives for example uh, there are things that you cannot see but you know they're real is that true yes or no for example the wind uh, when Nicodemus who was a religious person but not spiritual can you be religious and not spiritual what's the answer yes, yes. So Nicodemus was a high, high person in the religious uh, faith of the Jews, but yet he was only religious and not spiritual. And when he met with Christ, Christ tried to move him into that spiritual realm, which Nicodemus could not comprehend. And therefore, that's why he said, what do you mean? Must you go back into your mother's womb and come back out again in order to be born again? And Jesus then shifted from the spiritual to the physical because most of us are acquainted with the physical with what we see what we feel is that true so jesus then said to nicodemus the wind bloweth where it wants to you hear the sound thereof but you cannot tell from when it's coming or where it's going so is everyone is born of the spirit so jesus then pointed him to what to the wind all right, so we see the wind here. Let me see if this tree moves. It's not moving. But you know that when a tree moves, what is happening? And if the tree is not moving, what's happening? There is no wind. And so you cannot see the wind, but you know that it's there by its force. In other words, when it moves something, uh, sometimes it howls through openings and you can hear the wind blowing. Uh, as it creates some sound, but you can never see wind. So that, that's why it says, Jesus says, the Spirit of God is like the wind. You cannot see it, but you can see its effects. 
So likewise, when the Spirit of God, you cannot see Him, but you can see His effects. So we deal with something called effects, that which you can see or sense. There's something else called bacteria. How many have you ever seen bacteria? Any of you? Because you have not seen it, does it mean it doesn't exist? Yes or no? No. Uh, bacteria is, is something that, that's uh, it's quite interesting. And uh, it actually looks, uh, this is a paras uh, this is actually the way that bacteria is working. And you can see that this is actually uh, under a super microscope, seeing how the bacteria is actually working and the fact that it actually creates all sorts of diseases and brings about many deaths. So there are millions of people dying as a result of the bacteria. You don't see it, but when it hits you, you know that something has hit you. Is that true? How many of you have had influenza, the flu? Any of you? How do you feel when you get the flu? Good? No. You know that something's hit you, but you cannot see what hits you. All you know is that something hits you. Is that true? Uh, the same thing with viruses. Uh, a virus uh, actually is... Uh, there's the viruses. How many of you have ever seen the virus? You have now. Okay. Again, this is under a microscope. Uh, the reality is when you get a cold, it's not because you got chilled. When you get a cold, it's because you got a virus. See what I said? Yes? My niece is shaking her head. She's a doctor, studied nursing for many years, and uh, dealt with many viruses, I'm sure. You cannot see them, but you know they're there by the, by the effects on the people. There are other things you cannot see. How many of you have ever seen atoms? Have you seen an atom? Okay, well, uh, how many of you see, uh, have seen molecules? Well, uh, an atom is basically the smallest constant, uh, item that uh, makes up matter. You are right now sitting on a bunch of matter. Okay, the benches that you have happen to be made of the same molecules. And uh, because they're made of the same, same molecules, they hold together. And even though they're spinning, you don't feel like they're spinning because you cannot see them spinning. But it doesn't mean that they don't spin. It just simply means you can't see them. And because they spin so fast and they're so tiny, they can make solids. It's just like on a, on a spoke of a wheel, when you see a car wheel turning, right? You know that there are spaces in that wheel, but when it spins, it looks like a solid. It's the same thing with the, the molecules. They spin so fast, but they hold together, and they either make wood or make plastic or whatever uh, material, and that is uh, what makes up what we are surrounded by or what we are used to. And even though you cannot see them, it doesn't mean they do not exist. You understand? How many of you have been affected by something called gravity? Any of you? I remember when I was a trampolinist a long time ago in New York City. Brooklyn, Canarsie. Uh, I used to go on the trampoline quite often. And I knew what gravity could do. But I knew that if you jumped high enough on the trampoline, you can do tricks. And so I used to do somersaults, etc., on the trampoline. Uh, you can never see gravity, but you know it exists. But if you've never fallen, you don't know that it exists. You understand what I'm saying? The same thing with what is called centrifugal force. How many of you are acquainted with centrifugal force? Any of you? All right. How many of you have gone in the car? I remember one time we were traveling up to Hayuja, and uh, my poor niece began to get car sick. I don't know if she remembers that or not. <laughs> All right. It's because Uncle Louie was going around the corners too fast. <laughs> and so she began to get sick, and I didn't know that she suffered car sickness. Anyway, centrifugal force just pushes you to the side, right? Uh, how many of you have been one of these rides? Any of you? Huh? Okay. There you go. Now, what's holding you against the wall? What holds you against the wall? It's centrifugal force. You cannot see it, but you experience it. Did you hear what I said? 
You cannot what? You cannot see it, but you must what? Experience it. The same thing with the sicknesses. You, you don't know it's real until you get sick. Uh, there are many things that uh, affect you. You don't know there's gravity until you fall or you see something fall. Uh, there are many things around us that we cannot see. But the fact that you cannot see them or you cannot touch them does not make them uh, unreal. It just means you don't have the ability to see or touch them. But they have the ability to touch you. And when they touch you, you have the effect that comes from those particular items, whether it be the uh, gravity, whether it be the centrifugal force, and there are other things that I can explain that you cannot see. How many of you have ever seen electricity? Any of you? Any of you have seen electricity? You're raising your hand for naught. You know why? There's not a human being that's ever seen electricity. How many? Not one. What you see is the result of electricity. In other words, right now you see that, uh, what electricity is doing in the light bulb. It's causing it to shine. When you see lightning coming down, you don't see electricity. What you see is the elements heating up as electricity flows through the elements. The spark that you see, you don't see electricity. You see the, the electricity uh, sparking metal. So when you see the, me the metal sparking, you know electricity is there, but you don't see the electricity, you see the results. Does that make sense to you? Yes or no? Now, if you don't believe that electricity exists, just put your finger in the socket, and you realize very quickly that it exists, even though you don't, what? You don't see it, all right? So there are many, many things I can tell you about. I'm a professional scuba diver, and I can tell you that there are many things in the water that you cannot see, but you have to believe that they happen because if you violate them that's when you experience those things that they tell you like the secret what, what they call the the rapture of the deep or they they uh they may have a narcosis or there are other things that happen as a result of you violating the rules that they teach you in scuba diving so if you follow the rules you're okay here i am i've made many dives in many countries and i'm still here because i follow the what the rules People who don't follow the rules get the effects. For example, if people, uh, when they're in the water, there's pressure on you that you don't sense. The only time you sense it is in your ears, but once you equalize, you don't have the problem anymore. But if you have to get up as fast as you can, you have to let go of your air, not hold your air. The reason for that is because there's much pressure on the knee and you're breathing pressurized air, it is equal to the pressure outside, so you don't feel any pressure. But if you take a deep breath and try to come up fast, the pressure inside will be greater than the pressure outside of the water and your lungs will simply just explode and you die. So there are many things that can have an effect on you but until you experience it, you don't know it's there. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes? And that's the problem with God. People want to see God, but if they saw God, they would be in sore problems. Here's what the Bible says. God said to Moses, You cannot see my face, for there shall no man see me and what? Aren't you glad that you don't see God? Because if you could see God, you would no longer see. That means you would die. How many of you want to die? I don't see any hands. So, when you deal with spiritual things, they're spiritual discern. And to try to prove God to somebody who doesn't believe is very difficult. Because you cannot put God in the test tube. But thank God that he cannot be put in the test tube. Because if you could, then you would be God. The fact that you can't see him doesn't mean he doesn't exist. It simply means you must experience him. You must what? Experience. You must experience him. Okay. Did you hear what I said? When I was in show business playing with Bill Henry and the Comets, I did not believe in God. Even though my mother was a praying woman, even though I was taken to church when we were kids, uh, when I was in show business, all this idea of God just simply dissipated. 
I did not follow God, didn't believe in God, didn't practice God, didn't believe in religion. I thought religion was for people who were too dumb to do anything else with their lives. And I thought it was only for the old and the ugly. If you're old and ugly, you might as well go to church. <laughs> I'm serious. It was not until I experienced God. Until what? Until I experienced God. You could have never proven to me that there was a God unless I had experience with God. And when my experience with God was so real that it made a complete change in my life. And when I experienced God, I immediately left show business and decided I was going to follow this God that I experienced. I didn't know where he would lead me. I thought that my final end would end up in a machine shop in Brooklyn, New York, working as an as a immigrant until Jesus returned. But I was willing to do it because I experienced the reality of God. Now, that's why God said to Moses, be careful. Be careful about me. Don't try to think that uh, I am something that you can put in a test tube. So he said, You saw no manner of solemnitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. You saw no what? No matter of what? Similitude. In other words, you didn't see a form, etc. So be careful, he says. And so, when I was in Thailand, and I had to preach to the Buddhists, and we did get permission from the chief to do evangelistic meetings, uh, health, we, did, we call them uh, physical and spiritual well-being. And so we did a health talk to begin with, and then I presented the spiritual. And in order to help the Buddhists understand something about God, I had to tell them stories. Tell them what? Stories. So what is God like? I was holding an evangelistic meeting in a place called uh, Woodburn, Oregon. And there was a couple that came and were baptized. And after her baptism, she told me her story. Here's what she said. My husband and I got married when we were young and we were madly in love with one another and my husband wanted to build me a house but we were too poor to do anything like that so he heard about these guys who were going out to america and sending money back to to mexico so he got the bright idea he'll go to the states make the money send it back and then we can build a house so he left with the uh, agreement that he would write me every day and that he would send the money back so we can build a house and we can be happy forever after in Mexico. When he uh, left, he, he began to write every day. And I was always excited to get his mail because I could trace where he was going by his mail. I'm here, I'm there, etc. But the mail became less and less and less and finally it stopped. And she was worried. She wondered what ever happened to him. Is he sick? Did he die? Why isn't he writing? And it was not until several months later that she discovered what had taken place. He had found another woman. And that devastated her. It devastated her so much that she became physically ill and landed in the hospital. She was just uh, broken hearted. And while she was in the hospital, one day it came to her why this whole thing had happened why it was that her husband went up there and she decided that she was going to figure out a way how to build the house so that her husband could come back because he left because he had no house so she got well got out of the hospital and bought some little chicks raised them and then had chickens and then had eggs and then with the eggs she began to sell them and then bought a cow and then with the cow she got milk and then she had another cow. And then she had another cow. Now she had chickens, she had eggs, she had cows. And she was making money. All right? Meanwhile, she wasn't hearing anything from her husband. Finally, she started building the house. She furnished it. Refrigerators, couches, completely furnished the house. And, uh, but she locked it up because she was hoping that somehow the husband 
would come back. And finally, one day, there was a knock on her mother's house where she was staying. She opened the door, and there was a husband. He had been kicked out of the house by the woman. So he had no place to go but go back home. But he had heard from the guys that would come back and forth that his wife was deathly ill in the hospital. So he came at least to uh, see her before she died. And he was shocked to discover that she was not ill, but she was well. And he was surprised. He said, what are you doing here? Well, she said, I've been waiting for you. Let's go home. And he, he said, she is sick. She's mentally ill. <laughs> so he thought, uh, no, we, we don't have a house. Yes, we do have a house. No, we don't have a house. And he was seriously thinking she lost her mind. So she said, come with me. So she grabbed him by the hand and left and went to the house. And there was this beautiful house. And she took out the key and put it in his hand, opened it up. And he was just dumbfounded. What are you talking about? She said, open the door. And so he turned the key and opened the door, and he was just amazed. It was fully furnished. And she said, you remember the home that you wanted to build? Yeah, I built it for you. When she said that, he fell down to his knees and began to weep and said to her, you have been so faithful while I have been so unfaithful. Why? Because I love you. That is what God is like. He is a loving, compassionate, faithful, lover of our soul. Amen. You cannot put that in a test tube. And that's a picture of the lady, by the way, and the pastor who was uh, baptizing her, Pastor Ruben Sanchez. And Uncle Eugene, you see the guy that's behind, right between? You know who he is? Huh? He needs, he, needs, he needs glasses. All right. I'll tell you later. I was holding an evangelistic meeting in Romania. Communism had just toppled. And they asked me to do an evangelistic meeting. There were about 4,500 people in this series of meetings. I don't know if you can tell that the one standing there is the young guy there. That's me. I had two translators, one to Hungarian, one to Romanian. So I had to always try to remember what I've said. Because once I said something, it was said into Romanian, then it was said into Hungarian. And I had to remember what I said so I can continue on with the sermon. You understand? So when I finished the meeting, uh, Hundreds of people were baptized, praise God. Uh, but among many, many different experiences in that particular meeting, okay, many different experiences, miracles took place, there was a lady, young woman, who heard about the Sabbath. And when she left, she only came because people kept on inviting her and inviting her and inviting her and inviting her. And she, she would say, yeah, I'll come, yeah, I'll come, yeah, I'll come, yeah, I'll come. And I was getting close to the end of the meetings and I presented the Sabbath. And she happened to decide to come on the night when I was presenting the Sabbath. So you normally speak and don't want people to come at that particular time. You want them to come beforehand so they have at least learned something about Christ before you teach them about the Sabbath. You understand what I'm saying? So what night she shows up on the Sabbath? Okay. So, and that's the only meeting she attended. And the reason she came is, these people are driving me nuts. So I'm going to go one time and get them off my back. And that's what she did. She attended one time just so she can get them off her back. But when she heard about the Sabbath, she was troubled. She was a Presbyterian. 
So she left that meeting and was just very troubled. Then it was announced uh, that a Presbyterian evangelist was coming into town to counter what I had been presenting. So this evangelist came, fortunately, the hall that he had only had 600 people. So it was not, was not gonna affect the 4,200 people that I had, 4,500 people, okay? So, but when she sat at the meeting, she said to me that what was presented even made her more certain that maybe this is right. But she didn't want to accept it. And so she began to pray and she prayed this, God, if this is truth, then bring back that American and then I'll believe it. Now I want to tell you this, I went to Romania for the first time and had decided never to return to that country. Not because it was a bad country, but because the people that controlled the airport were shysters. Uh, those of you from New York, you know what the word means, right? <laughs> shysters. Okay. So, uh, in fact, when I got to the airport, the lady says, uh, you got uh, too much baggage. I said, what do you mean? She said, it'll cost you $300 for that suitcase. I said, that's not a suitcase. That's a blanket that they gave me. And never mind. $300, you want to get out of Romania, $300. And I said, Madam, I paid $268 for the whole trip. She said, $300. I said, I'm sorry, I don't have $300. Uh, what do you have? Well, I said, I happen to have $100. Okay, give me that. So I said, okay, give me a receipt. Well, I gave her the, the money, no receipt. You know what she did with it, right? Okay. And so I decided never to get back to that airport because I didn't want to be shot to again, you understand? So, this lady's praying. What is she doing? She's praying that what? That I get back. All right. But what was my intention? Never go back. So, what happens? They call me up, urgently asking me to return back to Romania. Because since there was so much response, they wanted to take advantage of this open opportunity that opened up. And uh, the people were begging that I would return. At that time, I was secretary in Great New York Conference, so I was the secretary of the conference, and I had a lot of work to do. Uh, but they just begged that we return. So we did return three months later, all right? And three months later, when I returned, on Friday night, they asked me to preach in a little small church uh, on Friday night, so I did. So in that church, I, was, I made a presentation on Jonah and the whale. And there's a verse in the book of Jonah that says, And the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. The what? The second time. So I, I then made an appeal. And who do you suppose responds? The woman responded. She came forward. She was crying. And she said, I got to talk to you. So I said, what about she said, I've been praying that you come back. I said, you have? She said, yes. She said, when I heard you the last time you talked about the Sabbath, I got so bothered and so troubled and I was so worried. I was hoping that it was not true because if it was true, I was going to have to keep it and I didn't want to keep it. But I prayed and I said, God, if it's true, bring that man back. But she said, when you preached, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. I surrendered. She <laughs> said, I believe it. I believe it. You know what's wonderful? Is that God is a personal God. He knows you. He knows who? You may not know him, but he knows you. And he knows where you live. He knew where Saul was going when he showed the light. He knew where Peter was lodging when he sent Cornelius to send for some servants. He told them the exact address where they could go and find Peter. Obviously, God knows you. He knows where you are. So God is a personal God. A what? A personal God. He's a loving, compassionate, caring God, but he's also a, a personal God. You may not be aware of him, just like I was not aware of him. But he knows where you are. He knows your needs. He knows your tendencies. He knows your rebellion. He knows all about you. You may not know much about him, but he says that everything about you, he's written in a book. 
Do you hear what that said? He's what? He's written a book. And listen, for years and years and years, they thought that's not possible. How can God write things in the book? Now you got computers. Now you got what? You got computers. And you can put all sorts of stuff on the computer, right? And you press the button and you want to find it. What happens? You find it. It's still there. Is that you, Tony? Tony works for the hospital and he deals with computers. Still do. Still does. And so, what didn't seem possible before, now we know it is possible. People, I remember when I was a kid, I used to see people moving their lips, you know, and I used to go, you know what that means? Okay. People are crazy. Who they talk? Who they think they're talking to? But now, you hear people talking to themselves all the time. Isn't that true? Yes or no? You go into a restroom, public restroom, and you hear somebody talking in the commode, right? Who are they talking to themselves? No, they're on their phones, right? You understand what I'm saying? Now, nobody, 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 nobody doubts the, 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 the question, the, 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 the idea that it is possible for your voice to sail up into space. No one questions that now. And if man can do it with the plastic, God can do it with his system. The good thing about God's system is he doesn't charge you for minutes. Isn't that wonderful? What is God like? God gives us many, many experiences to help us to understand what God is like. Listen, uh, in conclusion, because I know I'll skip this story. But I, was, I know you don't want me to skip it, but you'll have to come back again. Okay. Uh, when I was serving in Guam, Guam Micronesia Mission as president, how many of you know where Guam is? You don't know. It's in the Pacific Ocean, and by the way, it's in Guam that Adventist World Radio has its antennas pointing to China and to all the, the, the communist countries, uh, beaming the, the message out there all the time, okay? Um, when I was serving in Guam, we had telephones, stateside, and we had telephones Guam side. Because in Guam, even though it's part of the United States, it's, it's kind of like a commonwealth of the U.S. So everybody that's born in Guam is a citizen, just like in Puerto Rico, everybody that's born in Puerto Rico is a citizen. But they treat Guam like a foreign country when it comes to, to uh, telephone system and all that. So in order for us to use our phone in Guam, we would have to pay $2.60 a minute. You understand? So we wouldn't do that, so we would just uh, buy a local phone and use a local phone and shut off our stateside phones. So one day I had to send, I'd send my wife back to the States, and I'm watching as she's going through security and all that, and she's carrying her violin. And those of you who are family members know how old that violin is, right? So she's carrying the violin, and I'm watching to see, and finally she disappears in the crowd. So I can't see her anymore, so I can't tell she picked up her belongings after the, it went through scanning and all that. So I went down, got in my car, began to drive away, but I was impressed not to leave. So I parked. And I did not know if she had her violin, and, but the problem is I can't talk to her because she has her phone turned off. So here's what I did. I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I know that you're dealing with billions of people who have all sorts of requests that come your way. But can you do me a favor? Can you send a, a beam down to my wife and, and nudge her to call me? Now that sounds like a ridiculous prayer, right? And when I said in the name of Jesus, amen, all of a sudden my phone rang. My wife's calling me. Okay. She said, honey, do you have my violin? I said, no, you have your violin. No, I don't have my violin. Where are you? I'm on the plane. So well, get, off, get, out, get up and tell the flight attendant that your violin is someplace back in security. And I'll run over and find out what I can find out. So I drove back, ran up the stairs, got to security, and they knew me because I used to be the chaplain, head chaplain for the police department in Guam. 
that while I was doing uh, presidency of uh, the mission, I also felt like I needed to be involved with the community. So I became the chaplain of the police department. Chaplain, what's the matter? I said, my wife, she, her violin, someplace in there. Don't worry, chaplain, we'll figure it out. So they took off, okay? So they were running and running and running. And uh, all of a sudden, my wife called back. She said, okay, honey, I got the violin. <laughs> so I went downstairs, got in my car, ready to drive off. And all of a sudden, I was overwhelmed. in my being so caught up with trying to find the violin and making sure she got it, I had forgotten the prayer I had made. And all of a sudden I paused and I was overwhelmed with the reality that my God, who's so great and has so much to do, could listen to my simple prayer and answer it immediately. I started crying. Do you understand? My God is a real God. Do you hear what I'm saying? I can't touch him. I cannot see him. But I can experience him. When he, in that night in my conversion, when I prayed, because I was agonizing, all of a sudden my sins came over me like I, I was a lost, lost sinner. I had never felt lost before, but in that night, as I began to feel lost, I was kneeling down and, and agonizing with God. I had, I had not prayed, didn't know how to pray, was never taught how to pray. But as I began to talk to God, I felt worse and worse and worse. And finally, I said, take it all away. And all of a sudden, there's a peace that came over me. As if though I was no longer a drinker, a smoker, or a druggie. Instantly, when the peace came over me, I realized something had happened. And that night, I understood that God was real. Don't expect to see him. Experience him. Search for him. For he says, ye shall find me when you shall have searched for me with half of your heart. With how much? All of your heart. And dear people, listen. Listen. If there are ever a time in our history where you need to have the security that God is real, it is now. There are things that are happening in our world that are going to come as a storm. You know, because I fly high all the time, the higher you fly, the more you see. And I can see things, folks, that you cannot see. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are heading for very difficult times. And the only thing that will give you peace is a certainty that God is real. Amen. That the Lord is there. That no matter what happens to you, he will take care of you. He'll see you through. He'll give you everlasting life. He loves you. He wants you. But you must desire him. Amen. Don't expect some supernatural thing that happens. And it has happened. There was another lady attending the meetings in that Romania meeting. And when I spoke about the mark of the beast, that woman got infuriated. Even though I didn't even mention the name of the institution. I just gave them the identifying marks. But she was so well uh, uh, informed about history that she immediately knew who I was talking about. And she was right on the floor. In the floor they had about 500 seats. Only visitors could sit in those 500 seats. So this lady got up and she was infuriated and she started coming up and she wanted to smack me in the face. And the deacons had to haul her back. She was so angry. And she said, I'll never come back to this place again. 
she left. The next night she was back. <laughs> and the deacons were surprised. <laughs> what are you doing here? Well, she said, I was so mad. I was so mad that he would talk about the Holy Father that way. And remember, I never mentioned who it was or anything. But she figured it all out. And she said, I wanted to smack him in the face. But she said, in the mo this morning, I got up. She said, I was sweeping in the house. And I heard a voice behind me. It scared me. Because I was alone in the house. So she said, I turned around slowly. And there in front of me, she said, I saw Jesus. And he said, go back to the meetings. Those are my children. She said, she just humbled herself and she determined she was coming back. And she was among the many that were baptized. Amen. Now, I cannot tell you what she saw because I wasn't there. All I can do is tell you that what changed her mind with the reality that the Lord somehow appeared to her and enabled her to understand that this was his truth. What is God like? I'm glad that he's a compassionate God. I'm glad that he is a personal God. I'm glad that he is a powerful God. I'm glad that he's an all-knowing God. I'm thankful that he's a caring God. I'm grateful that he's a provider. I'm grateful that he can guide and direct. I'm thankful that all that I need, he can give me. And all that will be satisfying to me, he will provide. And at last, I'm grateful that he has the power to give me eternal life. What do you say? That through him, I can live for how long? Forever. How many of you want to live forever? Can I see your hands? And I wondered this morning, I'm so thankful that you kids were baptized. But you know, it takes time to know God. It takes what? It takes time to know God. You have to spend time with him. You have to spend time with him. You have to seek him. And if you spend time with him, he will in one way or another make his presence known to you. Is there someone here who's been struggling with the whole idea of God? And this morning, you sense that you want to get to know him better. And you'd like to lift up your hand and say, Lord, I want to know you better would you lift up your hand now are you willing to lift up your hand now and say yes God I want to get to know you better I want to experience you I want you to be my God and my Lord let us pray our oh, father how grateful we are for all the wonderful things that you do we know that you exist for nothing would be here if it were not that you have made them. We recognize that those science believes that things evolved. We know that it's impossible for things who are inanimate just to come up with their own ideas to become an apple tree and a pear tree and a peach tree. We know, Father, that animals don't just function by what scientists say but obviously you've created them in a way that they can respond to love and care and father we know that everything about us is not just by chance and in the name of your son we pray that you will enable us to experience you in the way that's unique to each one of us and that we may know a certainty that you are real. You've seen our hands. Bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.